I want to welcome everyone to the Humphrey Institute. This, uh, my name is Brian Atwood. I'm the dean here, and particularly want to welcome those of you who really make an impact on an issue that all Americans should care deeply about, and indeed all citizens of the world should care deeply about, uh, climate change. I want to thank uh, Steve Peterson for asking me to welcome people. Steve was vice president of his class a few years ago here at the Humphrey Institute. And, is one of many uh, graduates in our urban regional planning program that are making an impact around the state here in Minnesota. And I think we can all feel proud of what Minnesota has done in setting legislative goals uh, to limit greenhouse gases. But we all know that much more could be done, uh, particularly if we want this state, as it has been so often in the past, to be a model for other states. Um, we still may need to run a bit to catch up uh, to places like California that have done a great deal. And let us hope that uh, we'll have a federal administration that uh, cares deeply about this issue and that will uh, take the lead in terms of what the states are doing. Uh, we have a number of uh, entities here at the Humphrey Institute that are concerned about climate change and transportation and land use, obviously the most important being the, the Masters Ur for Urban and Regional Planning program. And people like Ed Getz, who directs that program, um, Carissa Shively Slaughterback, who's done a lot of work in this area of land use and the environment, Elizabeth Wilson, who's an expert on, on carbon sequestration and one of the national leaders uh, in the climate change area and transportation scholars like Yingling Fan and, and Jason Cao, both Chinese nationals uh, and who are here contributing to the state of Minnesota right now. And of course, the state and local policy uh, planning program uh, headed by Lee Munich, who's here today. Uh, they do a wonderful job. So we're trying to make a contribution, and so we're pleased uh, to be hosting this session today. Now let me introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Reed Ewing. Uh, Dr. Ewing is a professor of city and metropolitan planning at the University of Utah. He's associate editor of the Journal of American Plan uh, Planning Association, a columnist for Planning Magazine, and a fellow of the Urban Land Institute. He's author of numerous writings and for many years was the best-selling author for the American Planning Association. Dr. Ewing has served in the Arizona State Legislature. He worked at the Congressional Budget Office and taught city planning in Iran and Ghana, so he has a global reach. He received his master's in engineering and city planning from Harvard and his PhD from MIT in urban planning and transportation systems. Today, Dr. Ewing will be discussing his book entitled uh, Growing Cooler the evidence of urban development and climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Reed Ewing. Well, thank you very much. I, I um, really hate to give this talk on a cold day. So I, I went to the NOAA website and, um, and downloaded temperature data for uh, Minneapolis, the airport location, because I thought uh, the, the airport environment wouldn't be corrupted by uh, urban heat island effects, or not much anyway. And this is what I got. Now you could do it yourselves uh, and get the same result. I've, everywhere I go, I now download annual uh, average annual temperature data. I did it in Rochester, Minnesota when I was speaking there, and there was about a four degree uh, rise in temperature over a 30 year period. Uh, here it's about three degrees. That's a little more than most places in the US, but I can assure you wherever you do it, uh, you're gonna get a result similar to this. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, over land, uh, two or three degree rise. Fahrenheit over a 30 year period. So there's a lot of variation and you just came out of a, a cold spell uh, here. On balance though, 
temperature is going up pretty significantly everywhere, and it will affect it will affect us everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to be talking a lot about um, the consequences of climate change uh, or the science of climate change. In fact, I'm not, not going to be talking at all about those. I know those issues have been vetted already. Uh, I'm just going to talk about urban development, its effect. But uh, suffice it to say, two or three degrees is significant, and we're going to see a lot more of same in the in the years ahead. It's uh, this is a, a ship that we can't turn around, really. It, it's going to go in one direction uh, toward higher and higher global temperatures. The question is, how much higher? Is it going to be two or three degrees? Will it be five or six degrees, which would be disastrous? So th that's all I'll say about the science. Um, so what does urban development have to do with climate change? When we began the Growing Cooler project, it, it came out of California. Uh, I was part of the... Uh, a decision-making process there and gave a talk and we, we began to write the book. And the reason we did is that at that time in California, uh, the, the focus uh, in the transportation area was on vehicles and fuels. Uh, in other words, vehicle technology and fuel economy, how could, they, how could they get fuel economy up? And fuels, how could they get the carbon content of, of fuels? used by motor vehicles down, and no one was talking about the amount of driving that uh, we do, and that being a contributor to CO2 emission levels uh, and ultimately to greenhouse gas accumulations. Um, so here, here's uh, an iconic image. Um, it shows VMT in the United States. Didn't have a chance to do this for, for Minneapolis or for the state of Minnesota, but it would probably be very similar because it has been elsewhere when I've done it. Uh, VMT, vehicle miles traveled, increased between 1980 and 2005, three times faster than population. In other words, we were, in terms of, in terms of growth, uh, the amount of driving we did increased three times faster than population. Here's another uh, image that's instructive. The amount of land occupy, occupied by urban and suburban development uh, also increased three times faster than population. Uh, so we call that sprawl uh, as the densities decline. So VMT went up three times faster than population. The land, the urban footprint of the United States, urban and suburban footprint went up three times faster than population. Here's another important image, and it shows uh, CO2 emissions by end use sector, and as you can see, transportation, which is the blue line on the top, uh, surpassed the industrial sector in the late 90s uh, to be the uh, leading uh, source of CO2 in the U.S. Uh, it's now responsible for about a third of total U.S. emissions. I don't know what it is in Minnesota, but could be a little higher, could be a little lower a third on average. Um, so that now is beginning to tie all that VMT to climate. Uh, and here's one more uh, image that's important. It shows that the U.S. with 5%, a little less than 5% of the U.S. of the world's population is responsible for 45% of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from light duty vehicles. So with 5% of the population, 45%. Now, why would it be so high? Well, we're a rich nation. We have, you know, high auto ownership. That's only part of it, though. Uh, we drive about twice as much as Europeans do. So we're now beginning to link these, these various themes together. This is the logic uh, model that, that uh, is implicit in, in Growing Cooler, the book. Uh, the world greenhouse gas emissions need to be lowered. To do that, the U.S. has to play a leading role. We're responsible for 45% of the light duty uh, vehicle emissions, but uh, overall a much lower percentage of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, about a little less than a quarter uh, with 5% of the population. U.S. has to be a player. In fact, we have to take a leading role.